Um, disclosures, though, first of all, um, and this is to show this is where I'm coming from. These are some of my biases and some of my interests. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, yes, this one. Uh, I started off many, many years ago, 1979, with one of the many NHS reforms. Um, and at that stage, I was, uh, I trained in, in the UK and was employed by Brunel University, Brunel Institute of Organization and Social Studies. And we did applied research into the NHS and social services, uh, as well as commercial industry. And when I, when I graduated in those days, um, we were all radicals. We'd occupied, et cetera, et cetera, lived in communes and things like this. And I'd spent my entire four years studying Marxism and psychoanalysis. Um, <clears throat> and what I'd gleaned from those, or what, what had really inspired me, is the more humanist aspects of that. And this was about both Marxism and psychoanalysis. One of the motives or ideas, it was a kind of enlightenment um, mission about raising to awareness some of the constraints which affect what we do, but we're not always aware of what those constraints are. And one of the purposes of research and science is to make us more aware of things that we're not aware about so that we can do something about it. So it was that practical practical and, um, I, I suppose you call it today, empowerment or, or liberational aspect that had always motivated me. And, and that's why I joined this Applied Research Institute, in part because they were, it was people from the Tavistock and they were using psychoanalytic techniques to understand what happened in the organization, but also they're very much an applied research uh, institute. Um, and that's what's led in recent years for me to think about evaluation for act action. Uh, so this sort of research that I did in the 80s at Brunel University was very much about partnership research. Uh, so it's very similar to the sort of things that you're doing. And in those days, we called it social analysis. In fact, there's a book written by Ralph Rowbottom called Social Analysis, um, or consultancy research, or clinical sociology. And Elliot Jacks wrote papers on that. Um, and in fact, my master's was on, is action research scientific? Because even in those days, there was quite a lot of action research going on. And it was done sort of almost entirely separate to health services research and, and medical research. Um, cut a long story short, uh, 14 years ago, after a career in public health in Sweden, um, I was recruited to the Karolinska Institute, which is a kind of uh, a large academic medical center. It's basically the cathedral of medical science. And most of the research is pure research on gene therapy, cancer, um, sort of high-end tertiary uh, research. Um, and we, we were setting up a unit called the Medical Management Center. And the idea was that actually we need to get some of these ideas into practice more quickly and in a more widespread way. Um, so even this high-end academic medical center was concerned about implementation and getting things into everyday primary health cares and hospitals. So this center was set up, but we knew that to survive at the Karolinska, we would have to publish in A-list journals 
and it would not be easy to combine this practical making a difference research with um, high status peer reviewed publications. I'm not saying there's a contradiction between those, that if you do one, you can't do the other, because rigorous research actually is almost by definition more effective. Um, if you find out what's really effective, not just what we think is effective through rigorous research, um, that's the way to go. And theoretically informed implementation and theoretically informed change is important. So a lot of it is about how to get the right mix, how to, for it to make a difference um, and at the same time to be able to publish. Now there's a long story and lots of discussions here about um, the way the world is changing and in, at this time it was much much more difficult to have anything that wasn't a controlled trial published in credible journals. Um, and very difficult to get any research that wasn't some sort of controlled trial. Um, it didn't have to be randomized, but it certainly had to be a controlled trial um, funded. And I, because my job is uh, to work on international collaborative projects um, as director of research there, I'm very aware about how the trend is towards more applied research of the type that you're doing, both in terms of funding, funding bodies, and also in terms of um, publications are more prepared to accept that. However, there's a big lag in the traditional academia and the reviewers of the journals still often have very little understanding of um, how shall I put it, more action evaluation methods to be able to judge whether it's good or bad of its type. And a very interesting field is health informatics and evaluation of health informatics technologies where they're much more um, familiar and more willing to look at action evaluation techniques. Um, in part because of the tradition of iteration to improve the product and the fact that you cannot hold it constant for three years. It's a totally different technology in three years' time. Um, so do look at the debate within the health informatics field, RCTs compared to other methods. It's a very interesting debate. And I would say the only area where there's more advanced thinking about evaluation is in health promotion and public health. Um, but I can come back to that later. So uh, that's a little background about my sort of practical bias. In terms of actual other conflicts of interest that I meant to declare, um, Joint Commission resources, the, the board membership of these different networks, the AHRQ Innovations Exchanges is worth having a look at for those interested in improvement and implementation. Um, and Current projects, these are the main projects uh, that I have uh, this year, uh, with the Veterans Health Administration on complex social interventions, but also on partnership research reviewing. And the clerks will be one of the approaches that, that I'm going to feature in that review. Um, uh, at the Karolinska, I'm coordinating the EU Implement Program for Chronic Care um, in different EU uh, countries, and we're also lead on the digital health technology support for clinical coordination um, in different uh, countries. So that's some of the biases and interests. Um, so questions to you. Your quick reactions, please, to these questions. And here is the choice, yes or no, but as I thought it would be mostly researchers, I've got an it depends category. Um, so who, I'm doing an evaluation. Hands up for those who would say, actually, yes, I am doing an evaluation. OK, so we've got about 20% of folks and people sort of in between. Um, 
I want to do an evaluation. Any hands up for that? OK, so we've got about 5 10% more want to do an evaluation. Evaluation can tell us if a change is an improvement. Hands up who would agree with that. Or, OK, so there's about 50%. Any who would disagree? Great. Oh, so what you'd say is, if a change certainly is an improvement, because you would want to track causality to and be then certain. And also find out what happens really long, long, long term. Uh -huh. And see also broader, so yeah. people do exactly. because they've managed to get that change, are they actually forgetting to do something else? Oh, okay. Oh, well, it, so, yeah, exactly. Okay, you're, you're heading in, uh, absolutely, these are, these are the issues. So, yeah, I think you're right to say it depends. What might be an improvement short term may not be one long term. Secondly, from whose perspective? Um, uh, it may be better for some, but not for others. Uh, and other, other questions. So, yeah. Evaluations often miss negative side effects. Who would say yes, and who would say no, and who would say it depends? Who would say yes, you often miss? Oh, OK. So that's 60% saying often miss negative side effects. Who would say no very rarely? OK, that's uh, what you would say is our evaluations don't. <laughs> Their criteria is we want you to look at this, this, and this. You can't publish in that arena without declaring warts and all research. And mm. sometimes a negative trial is as important. As well, well what, what I meant was um, whether you actually study and collect data about that. And I think one point I'd say with your audience is clinicians... Um, uppermost in their mind is first do no harm. So did this trial look at these possible side effects that could be harmful? So that you would, you, you are experienced and would want to include the data gathering to check that no harm was done in some of the classic areas. I think the thing that I was raising here is, yeah, but we can't gather data about everything, and there may be side effects. It depends what you mean. Are they unintended? Or yes, exactly. Well, they're they usually it's they're unintended. Unmeasured effects, isn't it? Yeah. Um, There's an important distinction between blind spots and blind spots as well, isn't there? Yes, so that's the point. If you're doing a particular kind of research, then you can report on all the things that, you're, that you might have blanked in your research, but not all the things you might have blinded. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I'm getting at with that one. Um, more, more in general, and evaluations always know what the change is when they start the evaluation. Who would agree with that? <laughs> who, who would say definitely not? And who would, who would do the, it depends on that one? I think most people would probably go for the it depends. Okay. All right. In my, a lot of the evaluations I do, and quite a few of them have been on overseas aid projects in Africa, um, there's the plan, and then you arrive and found, find out what's going on. And as one of my African colleagues said to me a few weeks after we'd been gathering data, and I was going on about, I can't see any outcomes, I can't see... He, he, he quietly, and this was after a few beers, he quietly said, John, that they haven't changed anything. Uh, and I, it still amazes me that he actually said that uh, because he was defending, you know, he should have been defending his country, getting some much needed money. But anyway, um, evaluation should explain variations in mm -hmm. outcomes to be of help to users. Now, who would agree? And by this, I mean 
that some patients, there are pretty impressive outcomes. Um, for others, there's no, no impact at all on whether the evaluation shows that or not. And the same for hand-washing program. For some staff, there's a big impact and compliance. For others, it seems to have no effect. And does the evaluation show that? And this question is, should evaluation should explain those variations to be of help to users? Now, who would agree with that one? Oh, that's interesting, 50%. 50 who would say, no, not necessarily. It can be of help to people without knowing variations. Would anyone agree with that? Uh, any, any for the it depends? Okay, thanks. So I, I think there's a category I missed here. I'm going to have to think long and hard about <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, the, how about this? The perfect is the enemy of the useful. Who would ag agree with that? A any disagree with that? We should always if we compromise on this. Uh, how about any, it depends on that one. Okay, so mo a lot of people are going for the it depends. Um, it depends on what? Anyone want to have a shot at that? What does it, what? How necessary perfect is. How? On how necessary it is to be perfect. Okay, so if we're going to spread something nationally, we, we need to get it pretty good before we spend that money and... and no, I was, I was thinking about whatever the, the intervention is that you're evaluating. For, how necessary is it for that to be absolutely perfect in practice? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. So, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. and in, in fact, the, the approach, I, I call it proportionality principle. The amount of certainty you need is proportional to the ease of implementation, the potential harm, and the costs. And if there's no, almost no possible harm, fairly easy to implement and low costs, I, I wish. Um, then you don't have to be as certain as you do, for example, heart transplant or a particular potent drug. So, um, uh, if you want certainty, do religion, not evaluation. Who, who would agree with that? <laughs> I, I would, actually. I don't think you're ever certain. So, um, the way it goes, just to spell that out, this is an old visual but the doctor and patient can both track over time the effects of different medications uh, on the disease activity score and also the patient reported outcomes that are regularly entered by patients. And um, the patient and physician are able to have a much better discussion about is that due to the medication or did you go on holiday then? What, what might explain that flare-up at that particular point and to build up an understanding of that illness in that particular person? So it's actually very powerful in, in a number of different senses. And just, just to spell out, uh, this is an old printout where they're having that discussion. Essentially, you've got the clinician and the patient and you've got the clinical database. It's one of 100 national quality registers in Sweden for different diseases that collects uh, patient data and treatments. Um, the most famous, actually, is the hip replacement register that's been running for 35 years, the orthopedic register, where every uh, procedure for replacing a hip is registered and patient outcomes. And this has led to, by feeding this information back to clinicians, 
there's been a convergence on about six processes and two procedures that has led to a, a much longer period and a lower reoperation rate uh, than previous years. So believe it or not, I, I was a runner, but had to have a hip replacement. But by looking at the data I, and doing this in Sweden, uh, I was pretty confident that not only was infection rates low, but that actually the hip would last. I hope I, I'm going to prove this uh, by giving it good good wear, because I'm down to walking now. Um, but I'm going to try and wear it out um, and see, see if it really was such a good one. Uh, but actually, it really does, it impresses me more what my mother went through at 84. To, she had a fractured hip and hip replacement and wall. It's not a walk in the park having a, a new hip. And I was really impressed by her English war attitude to this particular misfortune. Anyway, uh, the way this is developing is um, this uh, quality register is being built into a platform that will allow patients to contact other patients, a bit like the Patients Like Me website, and exchange experience and information with other patients with rheumatoid arthritis. But more importantly also is the linking, well, as important, uh, it allows managers to compare the performance of individual departments and individual clinicians with real-time, real data. So we, we can see which physician in, in Sweden gets the best X, Y, or Z cost per patient and begin to understand why. But also, um, at the Karolinska, we're building a bio uh, bank and genomic database that will allow us also to look at the genomic research about outcomes and understand better. So um, it's a very interesting and important development and uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the US is paying us to work with Dartmouth to look at the applications to the US. And in fact, I can send you the report if you're interested. But anyway, what are some of the questions that an evaluation could answer about this? Well, one is, does it make a difference? And I'll keep be saying this, is to whom? If we've got to focus, well, which stakeholder group will we focus on? Does it make a difference to managers? or clinicians, and in which aspect. And the drift of where I'm going is you can only focus on a little bit of that. Uh, and what that drives is what data you collect, what you then measure to inform the user of the evaluation. And that allows you to make it a very focused evaluation. How you handle all the other complaints that, oh, but you're not going to evaluate this, this, and this. What I'm saying is to do a good cost-effective evaluation, you need to focus like this. And one of the ways in which I negotiate with the evaluation sponsors is to say, OK, well, if you want all that, here's the bill. So it's a bit like. Um, Oh, what we, you know, you go into a restaurant, oh, I'd like that, and I'd like that wine, and that, that, and that. Well, there's the bill. Oh, well, let's, uh, no, we'll have a, a less, lower cost wine, or, and, and you basically have to negotiate through that. So, well, fine, but actually, I would also say is, even if they are prepared to pay all that money, you still won't get a terrible, you'll have to do a number of different evaluations uh, to get the design rate. So what I'm emphasizing here is the secret to evaluation is it's all at the front end. It's all about um, 
thinking through what decisions in the real world could be better informed by this research, um, and what design do we need to deliver that, uh, and to use that to drive the data you gather and the design you use, rather than, oh, well, this, this looks a good way to do that. We need a control. We need this and this. Um, uh, and then later on to start thinking about these sorts of issues when you get masses of data and you have to try and make sense of it. Uh, so it's all about preparation and negotiation, I would say. Uh, so another key question is, well, if, if we're going to change, and I'm focusing here mostly on the way we organize care, how much would it cost to change to the new way of working? So that's a key question. But again, I would say the front end or the early bit is, well, what exactly are we evaluating? What is the it that we're evaluating? And secondly, how do you most effectively implement that thing in different settings? And that's where I'm going now. Because in a lot of the things that we're evaluating, the biggest challenge really is describing what the intervention is in reality, in practice. Not what was planned, but what did people actually change? Um, and to describe that real change. So there was this before, and now there's this. And this is what they changed to get that. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> in relation to that example, one of the questions is, well, what do the patient and provider do that's different from before? Not describing all the system or so, but do they do anything differently? And this is the shared decision-making type of thing. And <clears throat> behind that, what was the information system that was not there before, which enabled that interaction? Uh, so, that is not self-evident from uh, the beginning, and it takes a lot of work to focus down on that, that particular thing. And what I'm doing here is I'm separating implementation from the intervention, because what I'm saying here is the other thing we need to do is describe what was done to change how patient and provider make decisions and what was done to establish the information in system and operation. And I'm saying this with hindsight after doing a lot of work on this because initially the request was evaluate the rheumatoid quality register system. No, they didn't even say system. The rheumatoid quality registry. Evaluate a database. And it was through this iterative negotiation with the customers. Well, actually, what we're really interested in, in is, does it make a difference in the consultation? And what we found was that simply having the information system available did not mean every patient used it, did not mean every physician engaged in shared decision making, <clears throat> and only a few actually did that. And if you want physicians to change the way they practice, and use this system for shared decision making, you need to provide training and support and other interventions to get that to happen. It doesn't just happen because the system is there and the information is available. Um, so that, that's sort of one of the things we come to. Now these are the things that help you describe what it is you're going to evaluate. The first thing is to break it into bits. Every intervention and implementation has different parts. So what are the different parts of, of the system? Basically, we've got before it was not used by patients and provider the treatment history, and later they use that. And before, physicians don't have fast access to tests, and later that's available. Um, a second thing is describe what is not, not being evaluated. 
So we're not going to be looking at this, this, and this. So that's to put a boundary around the change that you're looking at. Um, and then did the new way change over the valuation period? So often the intervention is changed, especially when you're looking at digital technologies. So this, there was changes made to the website, um, to some of the way the data was fed back, <coughs> and you have to document that as well. And that's what makes some of this tricky. Uh, so moving on, the second challenge, what do we measure to assess if it works? And what we're looking at here is a computer decision support. If we use laboratory measures of disease activity, uh, which is a particular protein antibiotic, antibody, um, that is one outcome of effective uh, whether the computer decision su support may be working. And then later show a lower disease activity. Would that be a good outcome? Um, so I'm raising that as a question. It, it would be one thing that many clinical medical researchers would, would look at, and it does have a certain purpose for doing that. Um, another way to gather data is just to ask patients or providers to score 0 to 5 on, is this better than the old way? And that's a different kind of measure. And I think a lot of it depends on who the evaluation is for and the issue about what's credible or influential to them and helps them make decisions. And that's a way to illustrate that. Now, this is, this is uh, a way of saying, actually, the issue is what are the criteria that the stakeholder that you're doing this for use? What value criteria do they use? And then how would you operationalize that in the data you gather or the measure that you use? And this is one way. Uh, so it's who is it for, one customer, to make a better decision? And what, what, do, what information do they need? Well, w which outcomes are most important to them? And limit the data collection by negotiating. So that's a way of... Uh, putting that. So there's what people want and then there's what they need for their decisions and there's attribution which is how certain and often if you increase the costs and rigor of the evaluation you can become more certain and whether you use proxy or intermediate indicators where other research has shown that relates to better outcomes. And that's lower cost and easier to do. So um, the third challenge, and I, I need to finish shortly. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just tell you the challenges and ways into this. The third challenge is attribution. What caused the outcomes? So this is a way of, this is a way of picturing the evaluation. Always draw a picture of your evaluation over time. If you can't draw a picture of it, you don't understand what's going on. And it's the most powerful way to summarize uh, what you're doing. So what this says is this describes a set of things that you would do to, quote, implement a computer decision support system. And that then, what we've got here is a computer decision decision support supported service and that's the intervention so what we've got is time and we've got people who didn't have this before and they have it later and this is a way of simply saying they go through this new they're exposed to this new way of doing it and all we have is two sets of measures I'll put it very simply before and after and um, this one will say, imagine that's the people's satisfaction with the old service before this. And then this is satisfaction with the new service. 
Now, I suppose one of the issues here is, are they able to judge? Or, or how do we know that the satisfaction is because of this or not because of something else? And with this sort of design, we're not able to exclude a lot of other explanations. But what we can do is list the other likely ones and make an appraisal or an assessment of how likely the influence of other factors are, as it's not a controlled design. So really what I'm emphasizing is all you've got is two data sets, and that's why I put outcomes in inverted commas. You never, ever know that the outcomes are due mostly to the intervention. All you have is an association between two sets of measures and a probability. And there are other things going on, even in a controlled, that, that can explain that. And it increases your certainty. So you never, I'm, I'm with Hume on this, you never pro prove causality. All you've got is associations and a high probability. And I'd be very interested in others' views on that one. Uh, so uh, you, we always use comparison to assess attribution. In that one, it's time series. Uh, you can use a comparison group that don't get it, or you can use time series, um, or you can ask patients or providers to make the comparison. Uh, and this is a, that's a classic example of a time series where you introduce guidelines to reduce ordering of x-rays in the emergency room. And in fact, it went up. But basically, the guideline, this guideline introduction, if you look at the pattern before and the pattern after, it possibly, it might have dropped it a bit, but it's not by any means conclusive. And that, that's one design you can use as time series of one, one indicator. Now, one other way into this, and I'll finish off shortly, is if you're doing a single case study, one way is to look at the causal chain and track whether this changed that and whether that changed that, like this. So here we've got an example. Nurses educate and help diabetic patients to improve their diet, exercise to improve glycemic control, to reduce the risks of avoidable emergency room and uh, morbidity. So we've got the intervention actions. You train the nurses. You've got proximal outcomes. So what changed in their awareness, knowledge, and skill, and motivation, and intention to act? Did anything change on that? So if you've got a change there, and what data would you collect to check that, then it's worth looking further downstream for data about this. Did they actually behave differently? Did the nurses actually do the education any differently? Um, and what, what data would you collect about that? And then it's worth saying, well, OK, did that change patients' behavior? And what, how would you collect data about that? And then, did you get glycemic control? And how would you get data about that? And then, do you have any? ER and morbidity rate. So really what I'm saying is that this is a way, sometimes it's called a logic model or program theory, and you can work through these intermediate edu uh, indicators. And I think there are too many evaluations that look at this, or mortality for goodness sake, and you simply can't attribute it to any intervention, even with good controls. So that's one... A lot of implementation research and a lot more evaluation research is saying, actually, you do need a program theory. That helps you decide which data to gather, and that helps you track causality. Uh, and that's one of the trends in, in this particular field. I need to finish off, uh, uh, and that's another example. Proctor has done a, an interesting paper on that, and that's an, a, a simpler way of putting saying the different levels of outcomes uh, before client outcomes. Uh, 
I've mentioned earlier about would others get the same outcomes, the generalization issue, uh, so I won't go on to that. The last one I'll say is um, to design your evaluation for usability, you need the users of the evaluation involved in different ways, ideally in the negotiation agreement. But remember, use is still different from increasing <coughs> usability. And this is people actually, you have actionable information that people actually act on. Uh, so that's a, another challenge and one for a, another day. Uh, uh, okay, I, I won't, won't go through those. Um, the last point I'll make is the debate and implementation research is, is should, evaluate, should implementation evaluation or implementation research simply assess fidelity to the evidence-based practice? Or should implementation research allow or indeed encourage people to adapt the intervention and study how they adapt it in the way we were talking about earlier? And there's an interesting discussion within implementation research about these sorts of issues. Uh, because a lot of it, originally implementation science was set up with the idea of, well, actually, we've got a proven evidence-based practice. All we have to do is get that into practices, get it into it. And so implementation research is only about fidelity. But there are more of us saying, actually, no, implementation research is about studying adaption. And then what raises the issue is, and do we then have to evaluate if they've <coughs> adapted it effectively? And do we have to, as it were, redo another evaluation? Uh, because one of the arguments with the fidelity evaluation is, so long as they copy exactly what worked elsewhere, we'll get good outcomes and we don't have to evaluate the patient outcomes. We just evaluate whether they implemented it. Um, so really what I'm saying is, uh, this is uh, an interesting paper by Chambers, recent paper by Chambers, about um, adaptive dynamic implementation research that you might look, look up if you're interested. Uh, so. Uh, I'll finish off there. Uh, I'll ask if there are any changes to your vote um, for any of those things and opening it, it up for um, comments, reflections, thoughts. It's just a reflection on the, the final slide, but one about adaptation. Um, and I think it's very interesting. I, I, I Coming at this from a different angle, my thoughts would be that generally transferring knowledge into a different setting um, almost inevitably involves some kind of translation process. So it's, in, it's interesting for me that that's a, that's a challenge and a concern, and I know this was picked up in the questions earlier, because I would, I would approach it on the understanding that essentially translation is always going to take place, so that fidelity is a, comes back to the, what you said before about this, this kind of notion of perfection, this perfect move of a practice and a set of knowledges from one context to another is not going to happen. That it, There's always some level of, of, mm. of translation taking place, which means some inevitable adaptation. Be um, comment. Uh, th three points. Uh, I notice you use the word translation rather than transfer. And uh, there has been that shift in the way people have talked about knowledge transfer. Uh, it's always translation, so I tend to agree with you. Um, the second, uh, a second point is we need to know more about why and how people do the adaptions, and that's related to what helps and hinders them doing it. And if we know more about that, then we're able to give um, research-informed inf research-informed advice to others uh, about how they might be more easily able to take up the, the change. I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment 
facing a lot of us working in this field is um, at what point um, does it become a different intervention that actually needs re-evaluating because we don't know if it's still active or it still works. Uh, so I think one of the issues is variation up to a point, but over what point might we say, well, actually, we no longer know if it's as effective as the, uh, the, the version that was evaluated. And here we get into a very, very interesting area of a kind of overlap between action evaluation and the simple plan, do, study, act cycle. Do, do most people know about PDSA? A lot of people in this country do. It's basically, it's a, it's a way in which people in clinicians and managers can do very simple evaluations. Um, the plan is, what we're going to do is we're going to make a change to our service or in how we treat these patients. The, the do is, okay, we'll change it for one or two patients or one or two units, and then we'll study what happens. And this means we need to be able to measure or get data on a few outcomes that we're interested in or a few changes we want to make. So that's the S. So P, plan, do, study, and then act is, well, if it works in this limited sample, um, then we'll extend it to a wider group and still keep testing. So all it is is a very simple test cycle um, using very limited data to, to get some objective feedback about the results. Now, when we're doing implementation research, we often, we certainly look at fidelity and we can use fidelity to assess how much they copy the original that was evaluated or how much they vary from that. And a lot of implementation research is fidelity assessment like that. But some implementation research is also outcome assessment at the same time. So, but they wouldn't be looking at uh, longer term outcomes. They would be saying, okay, well, did the providers change their organization or change their behavior? So it would be a limited assessment. Uh, now, the question, you can see that that's a bit like PDCA, PD Study Act because you're, you're treating the intervention as a test and you as evaluators are gathering data to see what effect it has. The issue is, do you as evaluators feed back that information to the implementers so that they can revise it or change it? And this is what gets into partnership research is or action evaluation is where you as um, researchers say, well, actually, we're not, it's not stand off and observe. We're going to be involved and engaged, and we're not simply going to negotiate what we do at the beginning and bring in the users to interpret it at the end. But actually, as we gather the data at a certain point, we will give feedback, and we'd say, we've observed these things happening and these results. And the idea is that the implementers or the people in the service would then adapt and change what they're doing as a result of the input that we give. So in a sense, that's, it's, it's very like PDSA, but you're saying, well, actually, the people who do the studying are part of it. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, and that, that is one way to go, potentially. But um, really, what, I, what I'm raising or drawing your attention to is a developing field of implementation evaluation that is looking at adaptations 
and figuring out, well, how would we know if the adaptation is a good one or a bad one? And is it more or less effective than the original that was studied elsewhere? Uh, and I, that's, that's very much um, applied, applied research with a, a lot of issues uh, involved in it. Um, just following on partly from that response and partly to um, thinking about, um, well, maybe what conclusion you came to in your master's thesis of uh, whether action research is scientific. Yeah. And, and more particularly, if, if we're looking at that kind of action evaluation or um, kind of participatory, uh, user-oriented research, what, what are some of the ways in which you've worked around the question of remaining critical while remaining useful and uh, that those kind of slightly difficult um, kind of balances you have to reach between, uh, well, bet between being perfect and being pragmatic and being being critical but be being useful to the organisations that are sponsoring you. Well, it sort of goes back to earlier. I I wouldn't say there's any contradiction between being critical and useful, because uh, managers and clinicians are quite capable of having a lunchtime meeting and doing a review. In fact, they do it all the time. How are we doing? What are the results? What data can we get from anywhere to check those results? What are people's observations and opinions? So all the time in the NHS, people are reviewing their treatments, reviewing their services. It's called being a professional. The issue is, what do we as researchers bring to... Uh, well, in part, the practice, the everyday practice. Uh, so I'm saying as researchers, there's, there's an important role for rigorous controlled trials um, and not to worry about the implementation and all of those issues, but just to rigorously evaluate a particular, especially for treatments and procedures. Um, but there is also a role for researchers to input to those reviews independent and objective data gathering that is informed by theories and perspectives. And that brings something different to those reviews. And the purpose of those reviews of treatments or of uh, programs or service delivery is to improve them and make corrections. Now, the data they've got as opinions and whatever stats they bring to the discussion. What we as researchers bring is an added value by knowing the literature, the theories, the interpretation, but also independent data gathering. And we may be able to gather other data or interpret it in ways that they don't have time or money to do in those lunchtime reviews. And that's what they're paying us to do uh, and we bring all of our skills in more rigorous and independent uh, assessment and research uh, to that. So I, I wouldn't say there's any contradiction between, how shall I put it, you use the word critical. Um, uh, I would say objective and independent and systematic. If it is critical of the service, that's part of the diplomacy which uh, researchers who are giving feedback have to learn, is to say, nothing personal, here's the data, don't shoot the messenger. And I, I think that's the role we need to, to keep. Because we will get pressure to say, to do things, to give favorable spin on it, and secondly, to give recommendations for what we should do. And we may be able to give certain recommendations, but we only stick to the evidence. And our main job is to make sure that the numbers, numbers always seem a lot more certain than they really are, to emphasize the limitations and that uh, at the end of the day, you've got to make the judgment, and that's why your paid money is to make these judgments and interpretations. And it's our job is to say what the limits of our knowledge are on this particular thing. And actually, on this subject, research can't help you. 
here's what the data say. Um, and yes, let's question and explore that from lots of different angles, but we, we can't go further than the data.